Hi, I'm Matt Adcock from CSIRO's Data61 in Canberra, and I'm one of the organisers of this symposium. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the Ngunnawal and Ngambri people as the traditional owners of the land we're meeting on today, and pay my respects to their elders past and present. Professor Blair McIntyre has been doing research in augmented reality since 1991. He founded the Augmented Environments Lab at Georgia Tech in 1999 and has been working on bringing augmented reality to the web since 2008. His research is currently focused on using distributed social mixed reality to support online conferences, meetings and teaching. He's worked on AR systems in the military, industrial, enterprise, educational and gaming domains and consults on technical design and legal issues in augmented reality. Please join me in welcoming Professor Blair McIntyre. Hi, thanks for watching my talk. I'm Blair McIntyre, professor in the School of Interactive Computing at Georgia Tech in Atlanta. And today I want to talk about some of my thoughts on the future of collaborative meetings in mixed reality, uh, so augmented reality and virtual reality. When I'm talking about mixed reality, I'm really talking about immersive mixed reality. So uh, virtual reality where you're looking uh, through a head-worn display at a fully immersive environment, uh, augmented reality where you're wearing a see-through display and looking around you at the world where additional bits of information have been added, like in the middle uh, set of pictures. I'm not really uh, thinking here about augmented reality on smartphones uh, because it's not really as suitable for the kinds of experiences I'm going to be talking about. So people have been experimenting with running meetings and poster sessions and uh, classroom experiences in 3D environments like this for, for many years, but a lot more attention has been paid to it in the last few uh, months. Um, the intuition, the reason why people want to try this is that our uh, whole lives are spent in a 3D environment where we're surrounded by stuff and we can interact with it uh, and other people. Uh, similarly, we should be able to get some of the advantages of our lifetime of spatial interaction if we immerse ourselves in a 3D experience versus just doing, say, 2D uh, collaboration via, say, video calls uh, with Zoom. Um, you know, perhaps one way to think about it is that a, a Perhaps one way to think about it is if you're at a poster session uh, in a real uh, physical space, you might wander up to a poster and listen to what people are saying and maybe decide to join in the conversation or maybe wander off. In a video conferencing setting, you appear in the video, you're now prominently one of the people involved. There's no way to sort of hover. Uh, and it's actually kind of disruptive for other people who are already there to have people come and go and, and so on. Uh, in VR, we can actually do things that mimic the real world experience. Uh, and we saw that kind of behavior at our poster sessions. So there's a lot of companies uh, and researchers pursuing sort of the, the obvious technologies that need to be developed and the obvious structures and ways of collaborating and, and, and so on uh, using these, these uh, mixed reality approaches. So uh, this is a video from Mozilla's Hubs uh, project. Uh, there's a lot of other companies exploring how you can create uh, 3D spaces with avatars where people can interact remotely with each other. Uh, companies like Spatial are working on augmented reality uh, remote collaboration where two people wearing uh, or a group of people wearing head mounts in both AR and VR could collaborate with notes and uh, other kinds of content uh, at a distance and they would see each other as avatars in the world around them. Uh, there's a lot of uh, work that still needs to be done to make these systems uh, uh, productive. Uh, but one of the questions that we should probably uh, ask is step back and say, well, let's even give us the sort of meetings we might imagine. Is the meetings in those pictures I just showed you what you think about when you think about collaborative uh, uh, experiences or remote meetings, even if uh, uh, you hadn't even thought about VR before, right? Uh, some people might imagine might, their end goal might be something like the Oasis and Ready Player One, the pop science fiction movie and book from a few years back. 
there, everyone goes into VR and is in this big collaborative world, even if they're sitting beside each other in the physical world. All collaboration, all work is done in the virtual world. In contrast, sort of more augmented reality focused views of the future, um, like Rainbow's End, imagine a world where we wear augmented reality displays and we completely transform the world around us, but we're still primarily rooted in the physical world. Of course, there's still many elephants in the room, things that need to be solved that don't get talked about a lot. So the things that we actually want to use to collaborate, the stuff, the images, the pictures, the documents, and so on, uh, need in our collaborative systems to be as easy to use and recreate and repurpose uh, as in non-mixed reality collaboration, but uh, even in non, say, video collaboration, right? So. Uh, many of us have experienced how difficult it is to sometimes share content when we're in the middle of a Zoom meeting. Uh, and it can be worse or in VR or AR or better, depending on how the systems are created. And so that's a big, big thing that needs to be considered. More importantly, perhaps, is that we can't build tools to support collaborating with all every possible kind of content into these systems um, because we can't recreate all the tools, right? Some of them are proprietary, um, but in general, it's just too hard uh, a job. And if we don't, we end up supporting certain collaborative activities, but not big C collaboration, right? We can't support the ongoing collaboration necessarily if we're trying to do all our activities uh, in these systems. Uh, finally, we need to think about, uh, if we're gonna work with these 3D systems, what uh, it means to present ourselves as avatars, for example. Uh, in, we've all experienced what it's like to be in a, a video call, a Zoom meeting, where we worry about uh, our appearance uh, and uh, how we're perceived by others. The same is true for VR, where you uh, may care deeply about how your av what your avatar looks like, what it says about you. And diff the systems right now don't really allow, really allow us to, to move avatars from one system to another or really carefully craft uh, what we look like. In some ways, these are all the table stakes that are going to be required to be solved if we're going to have really functional mixed reality collaboration in the future. And you might imagine that we're closer to uh, doing this in VR just because there's more VR systems out there. If you go and do some Google searches or if you're familiar with the, the, these technologies, there are a, bunch, a lot of uh, environments for doing collaboration in VR. Um, this is largely because the, the basic systems are, are, it's possible to create them now uh, based on, in some cases, the games technologies that, that uh, are used to create distributed virtual games and, and massively multiplayer online virtual worlds. Uh, but because of those problems I mentioned before, the need to be able to bring all kinds of content and to be able, need to be able to work with other kinds of applications and so on, it's going to be hard to to do ongoing work-based, non-casual collaboration and meetings in VR anytime soon, I think. Uh, AR, on the other hand, augmented reality, where I put on a see-through head-mounted display, like in the spatial video, and uh, I'm still able to interact with my computer, my desk, the world around me, uh, I think will actually happen sooner in work contexts than uh, VR, even though the technology is still a little bit farther away. So let's consider a few examples. So first, academic conferences. <coughs> so uh, conferences are uh, characterized to me by sort of short periods, so a few days a week, uh, so on, uh, with relatively intense collaboration where you're trying to do a lot of things. Uh, and there's been a lot of those recently, as I mentioned. I ran IEEE VR. Uh, in March, uh, it was intended to be in Atlanta and about two weeks before the conference, we went fully virtual. Uh, so we used a combination of technologies like, like Twitch for video streaming, uh, hubs for the 3D uh, parts of the conference, um, Slack and Slido and so on to try bring the essentially original conference format since it was already planned out and scheduled to uh, a distributed online uh, version. And so we used, you know, uh, uh, this would be familiar to anybody who's, who's been involved in one of these. Uh, we had panels and uh, in, in Zoom, uh, all of the watching, so all of the 
the the viewers were all uh, done via video streaming. So either on Twitch, uh, or we would send the videos into uh, hubs rooms as well, so you could watch in VR. Um, and it worked okay, right? If you've been to one of these, and, and for example, this one here, you know that it, it there's it doesn't feel necessarily as as social as a real conference, but uh, in terms of watching the talks, it was okay. Uh, where where the VR parts, the three D parts, really shined were in uh, the things that were more one on one. So uh, poster sessions, where you could actually, as I described earlier, walk up uh, and move around a space uh, and visit posters. Demos, uh, where people would decorate rooms and spaces with all of the media rele relevant to their uh, demo, and even do live broadcast their demos into the spaces. Uh, social gatherings, birds of a feather, small meetings, those things actually work really well in the social VR systems. Uh, in some cases, similar to something like Zoom, if it was if if it was a structured event where people were talking. In other cases, uh, especially for the social events, the ability to move around into small groups and, and sort of do different things in one space really uh, worked in a way that video conferencing doesn't support. Certain kinds of conferences, of course, could be fully virtual, like, uh, say, a product announcement uh, that Microsoft did in, in Altspace. But we, we found that a lot of the reasons people used uh, Twitch for the, the to watch the talks was because they wanted to do other things at the same time. They wanted to take notes. They wanted to do web search and they might want to read email. Uh, and that's just too hard right now in, in VR. And this goes to the, the comments I made earlier about uh, needing to be able to use all your tools and, and work as you normally would while you're collaborating. And I think that's the sort of big point and the, the hurdle that we need to get over if we're going to ever have sort of really effective VR conferencing is is that we've got good tools and we have to figure out a way on these platforms to be able to pull them into uh, our VR world and not try to recreate poor quality versions of them. So consider uh, another ongoing team collaboration uh, uh, example. So uh, if I've, instead of having a conference, I wanna have a, a, a ongoing collaborative experience with my team during uh, this uh, pandemic, uh, I need, uh, you know, scheduled meetings and so on, but I also want to somehow support an understanding of the pulse of the team, the serendipitous kind of interactions that uh, characterize working together. Um, this is not a new topic, right? People have been studying this going back to the 80s at Xerox Park, where they tried to use video and other forms of computing to support the kinds of collaborations you would get if you were together in a remote sense. And I think there, the, there's a ton that we can learn from that, uh, some of it uh, has to do with not just focusing on the collaboration itself. So the same groups uh, 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 were involved in uh, some of the Ubicomp work that, that was done a little later at Xerox Park, ubiquitous computing work, where they developed some of the first wall-sized displays, tablet-sized displays, tiny phone-sized displays, as well as a host of other technologies to, to support collaboration in the physical world. Um, the lessons that uh, they learned and others since them have learned about how to support collaboration, I think can inform some different approaches to VR collaboration as well. So, uh, for example, we uh, at Georgia Tech did this project in the, the early 2000s where we imagined the kinds of computing environments from uh, the ubiquitous computing work at Xerox Park, and said, how could we use the same technologies to support distributed collaboration instead of face-to-face, -face and, uh, and and use the space in the offices more effectively? So we uh, created, put projectors in, in our offices and uh, watched what people were doing on their uh, laptops and desktops uh, as part of their work. And we installed, you know, we had a little uh, system on all these, a little thing on all these systems that would grab screenshots and uh, watch uh, all of the activities you're engaged in and generate these these visualizations of of the tasks of your day and uh, and use them to give both you a, a reminder of what you were working on at different points over the last days, weeks, months, um, and the state of it, but also to help with distributed collaboration so that you could see when other people were working on shared tasks and so on. 
the idea was to really try to uh, create an environment where while you were working, you were aware of the rest of the team and what they were doing. And that I think to me is the critical point that we wanna create environments and change the way the environments work to support collaboration versus focusing on new kinds of collaborative applications. And I think in VR, we have uh, some really interesting opportunities to do that as well as in AR. So here's an example from uh, uh, that we did at Georgia Tech in 2015, uh, where we modified a Python programming environment so that whenever a student ran a program that generated a picture, it would display the picture in their place on the wall. Now this is a intro computer science class where the students were learning to program by manipulating pictures. And uh, we were motivated to try to uh, change the experience of being in one of these classrooms to be more like an art studio or an architecture studio where people could see what each other were doing and be inspired by each other and help each other. And by simply displaying the pictures, we actually achieved that goal. Uh, students would notice something interesting and, and ask how they did it. They would see a problem that they'd figured out before and ask the student if they needed help. They would notice even when a student's picture hadn't changed for a, a long period of time and ask if they were stuck and, and so on. And this was both the instructors and the students. So that was really interesting. Now imagine this kind of use of the environment in other kinds of collaborative situations, right? Where instead of just the walls being the walls, the walls could be covered with information uh, and visualizations to help you understand what's going on. And it doesn't have to be sort of overwhelming and information rich. We've all uh, uh, experienced if we've used things like Slack or, or Discord or Teams for uh, remote chat and, and so on, we've all experienced uh, the how they can be overwhelming, how they can be distracting and, and pull our attention because of the need to actually constantly monitor them. Uh, Hiroshi Ishii's group uh, back uh, at MIT, at the Media Lab back in the 90s, uh, did a, a variety of projects looking at how we can augment our physical spaces with information that helps us understand things that are happening in the world, but is not distracting. So the bottles, the light patches, the water ripple display uh, are conveying something about the world around you, about your team, about something you're interested in, uh, but they're doing it in a very ambient and non-invasive way. So let's say I wanted to just be aware of how many people are checking in code to the source code repositories. I could use the water ripple display, which is a, a clear glass ceiling with, with uh, a bit of water that drips uh, uh, drips into it at a different rate, depending on, on what's going on. And so if you're if the dripping is happening fast, there's a lot of ripples and it changes the light in the room around me in a different way. So I'm aware that there's a lot of activity, but I don't have to go and look at the displays and look at the web pages to, to see that, right? Um, when I think about uh, uh, these uh, future VR collaboration environments, meeting environments, that's the kind of displays I'm thinking about. Like, can we... Uh, take all of the information that might be useful, all of the questions you know people might have had if they watched this talk ahead of time, um, or the questions that might be asked right now, or information that might be relevant that people might want to share with each other, and put it into a 3D world around us, as opposed to just having this ephemeral chat that's going to disappear. And that, to me, I think is uh, what we need to start thinking about when we think about uh, collaboration, in particular, how we might take advantage of the 3D spatial nature of augmented reality or virtual reality is to not just solve specific collaboration problems, like how do I share a 3D model of something with someone? How do I share the video of a talk? But instead think about how do I use the environment, use the space, use uh, the original motivation of mixed reality, right? Our, our 3D spatial understanding and awareness, our ability to process things in the periphery and, and make these environments rich with information that's not distracting and uh, uh, overwhelming. So thank you for listening.